that are on the list uh, to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. And I call Paul Frew. Mr. Frew. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number one. And can I say that question number 11 has been withdrawn? Minister. I've got a can call you, and with your permission, I'm going to uh, group questions one and four together. The Interdepartmental Working Group was tasked with producing a report on the potential for bringing Loch Ney into public ownership. In December last year, I shared it with ministerial colleagues whose officials had contributed to the report through membership of the working group. Since then, the Minister for Culture, Arts and Leisure, having um, been considering the value of additional research to complement the findings in the report, the member will recall that during the Assembly uh, debate, many more issues other than public ownership were raised, and I intend to meet Minister Nicole shortly to discuss the findings of this work and assess then the next steps, including putting recommendations to the Executive as soon as possible. I thank the Minister for her answer. Would the Minister tell me why she has had this on her lap for a year now, and when she will publish the findings of the report? And is it the case that she does not like what is in the report? And that's the reason why it's on our lap. Um, I suppose it's, it's fair to say my sole focus in throughout this whole piece of work has been around unlocking the potential for Loch Ness. And I did the piece of work on the back of the debate that we had in the House. I took, established a working group, and that group got together and looked at all the, the potential issues. But then, um, further to that, and I think it'll enhance that piece of work, DECAL also started a piece of work and it engaged consultants actually to look at the potential of the lock. So the two pieces of work will complement each other. I've read with interest actually the members' comments in, in the media, and I think there's a certain wee bit of paranoia there. As I said, my sole focus is on um, unlocking the potential that we have there in the lock, and there's many, many issues that are being uh, discussed as part of that moving forward. Um, you'll be aware from the debate when we talked about the need for navigation control, overarching management structure, we've got the fisheries, we've got the tourism potential. There's so many issues there, and it's important that we get it right. So I intend, um, after I've just recently received the decal report, and I'm working my way through that, and I intend to meet with Minister Nicole and then bring her uh, report to the Executive uh, as soon as possible. Danny Kennehan. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the Minister uh, for her answer. Um, I'm told that last year there was a meeting on tourism looking at the fishing on Loch Ney, which came back with the report that there's no fish. Maybe, uh, Minister, we should be concentrating on getting the fish back up in there. And will, will she put all her effort into using those partnerships that she's built to actually build up so that we have the fish, we have the fishing, and we can bring in the money through that through tourism? I think that there's massive tourism potential on the lock. I think that's why this is an exciting piece of work and it's a good time to actually be taking it forward. But as I said, there are many um, competing interests on the lock, as you'd be very aware, fishing being one of them. But I think that there is uh, we need to continue to support the fishing industry to be able to fish on the loch. It's a massive, natural, an amazing natural resource that we have. Uh, and I think the fact that um, there is a need for an overarching management uh, strategy to take a look at all those competing interests and make sure that uh, we grow the potential of the loch uh, in a very balanced way. Uh, I wonder, could the Minister tell us when does she envisage that the report will be shared with the Executive? I would anticipate that um, I'd be bringing a finalised report uh, now that I've received the decal report and I can actually uh, marry the two pieces of work up. Um, I hope to be in the very start of, uh, I suppose, early part of next year that I would be um, bringing forward a report for the executive to consider. Because I think it's important that we do potentially, uh, because there's so many competing interests and different departments with responsibilities for different, um, different areas on the lock, that uh, we need to have an executive discussion on the way forward. So early 2014. Doris Kelly. Mrs. Kelly. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answers so far. But, uh, Minister, you will be aware of the concerns around the uh, water quality of the loch and also a recent uh, report from Queen's University about the deteriorating nature of food for particular migrant birds. So there is a particular pressure to get this right. Can the Minister tell us what action she has taken to improve uh, the water quality? I know it's a DOE responsibility, but the rivers management side of it, in terms of what the report might be suggesting at this stage? Well, as I said earlier, I mean, there's so many competing interests on the lock, and that's why it's important that we have this management structure in place that can basically marry up all, all the different uh, responsibilities from different departments. Because, as you said, DOE responsibility in terms of um, the water quality. So um, the piece of work that I've been engaged with has been looking at the whole picture and trying to bring forward recommendations, which, as I said, I'm going to bring to the executive at the early part of next year. And I'm moving forward then and looking at any sort of strategy for the lock then Water quality is a, is a key area that we need to be concerned with, and I'm happy to, to for uh, when we're moving forward and we're looking at plans for the future to work with all the different departments 
But I do think that we need to, to bring this all together, and now is an opportune time to do it with this piece of work. And it's important that we don't rush it, that we look at all the factors that are there, and that's um, certainly what I have done over the last number of uh, months. Megan Fian. Naga, can I question too? Um, I'm aware that the level of literacy or learning can cause some members of the rural community to encounter difficulties when competing in uh, various departmental forms. Many of my department's interactions with its customers involve the completion of such forms for the various schemes and grants that DARD uh, administers. While staff in local offices can help to explain these requirements and the information needed, they are unable to provide a level of assistance that would amount to filling out a form on a customer's behalf. A farmer who requests more specific help with completing an application form is advised by staff that they can appoint an agent, for example a relative or a friend or a neighbour, to fulfil a range of functions on their behalf. This can include the filling out of application forms provided uh, the department has been notified of this arrangement. Staff will also advise that organisations such as um, UFU, NIAPA and the Agricultural Consultants Association can also provide assistance. There is a cost implication for availing of these services either through membership fees or when employing an authorised agent uh, or form filler who charges for that service. Thank the Minister for her answer. Um, she referred to a number of options that are available to farmers, but is there anything else that can be offered if they don't want to go down that route? And do you think that there's a role for Dell in that? Yeah, um, for, for those that um, decide not to avail of the options that, that I have outlined, um, I've asked my officials to identify an organisation that could provide uh, more direct support. And given that uh, remit, the charity rural support is well placed to deal with instances where rural dwellers are experiencing anxiety and difficulties whenever they're completing their forms. This organisation currently receives annual DARD funding through the TAC and Rural Poverty and Social Isolation um, Programme. And my department currently provides literature on their services within the local office network. So should a farmer require assistance with form filling um, but doesn't want to uh, appoint an agent or avail of one of the supports from some of the farming unions or even use a form filler, staff in the local offices will advise that the rural support organisation can also provide assistance to those with learning or literacy issues. And appropriate guidance for staff will be put in place to ensure that literacy issues are handled with the utmost sensitivity. In terms of Dell, um, yes, I have also contacted Dell and they have agreed that uh, they will signpost their essential skills programme across the local office network. And that will include the provision of leaflets and general um, promotion at front office reception areas. And I have also asked my officials to investigate whether more could be done to address underlying literacy issues and numeracy rates amongst the rural community. And that will be taken, part, or be taken forward as uh, part of the uh, wider tackle on poverty and social isolation framework going forward. John Rogers. Mr Rogers. And thanks to the Minister for her answer so far. So, Minister, in terms of IT literacy, what support is there for uh, what training is available for um, farmers who want to do their online application for the single farm payment, particularly help for the farm, farmer union groups or the young farmers groups? Yeah, I mean, obviously we want to be in a position where more and more people actually submit their applications online and that's something that I very much encourage. Um, for those that don't have access to a computer, we have also have um, entered into some pilot projects with local libraries, so people have access to a computer and to internet access. Also, farmers can call into our direct offices where staff will actually um, take them through the process and show them there's a, a computer available um, there also. So um, I think there's a, a number of, um, for me, priorities, particularly in terms of trying to get more people online. We have to make sure the services are available and people are, are um, trained up. There's a number of um, courses that are actually being taken forward with um, BT Connected Communities to, um, project as well. So there's a range of areas uh, moving forward. And as I said, it's my uh, priority to try and encourage as many people to apply online as possible because it will speed up payments and, and, and the whole system. So um, there's, there's something to be gained for, for everybody from, from doing that. We're end. Mr Speaker, and actually my question was quite similar to, to the coll my colleague there. Um, could the Minister maybe outline if uh, literacy is taken into account whenever uh, you, you put the applications online and, and if that's something that you, you take into consideration and something that needs to be approved on? Um, well, whenever I, I, I was asked to talk to um, department officials, um, I was concerned about the, the problems that there potentially is out there. And I think maybe it's a nearly a, a problem that's not uh, readily identified, that there is problems with literacy uh, and numeracy in uh, rural communities. And I think that 
when I ask officials to go away and take a look, a fresh look again at what support we actually do provide, because we want to make sure that we're open and accessible and there's no barriers for anybody to uh, be able to apply uh, or to, to be online or to um, avail of any of our, of our services. So I have asked the officials to take a fresh look at that, and I'm very pleased that rural support are going to get involved and in actually um, physically helping people to, with their applications because it can be very stressful. Obviously, it's, it's your um, your income support, basically, if it comes to filling out your single foreign payment um, application, it's something that's essential to you and something that can very much stress you out if you're feeling you're not capable to deal with it. So um, I'm delighted that Rural Support are actually going to now work with DARD and, and hopefully that will enhance the service that, that we do provide. In McRae. Mr. McRae. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister referred to the conversation she's been having with Dell. Um, Maybe she'll let Glenn if she's been having any conversations with the Department of Education in respect of young farmers to ensure that, that they um, don't come out of the system with, with illiteracy problems. But could she obviously use the fact that you know, we talk about joint government to ensure that the um, organisations and the information that is out there and the help in the education sector can be promoted more fully within the farm sector? Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. And, and I have had discussions with the Department of Education, uh, Minister John O'Dowd, actually on what we can do. And I've visited some um, schools, particularly schools in rural areas, who would have a lot of focus you know, around the farming issues. And, and that, that's been uh, great pieces of work. So I'm happy and always happy to work with, across um, various departments to make sure that we have the most effective services in place. So that includes working with education and obviously employment and learning. Um, because I do believe that there is an issue here that we need to be seriously addressing around literacy and giving people the confidence and the support that they need to be able to um, avail of the services that they need. Thomas McCann. <coughs> Mr McCann. You, Mr Speaker, question number three. So far, Access 3 of the Rural Development Programme has offered grant assistance to 62 foreign businesses to the value of 2.6 million under Measure 3.1, Farm Diversification to Install Renewable Technologies. 76 foreign businesses received just over 274,000 for completion of feasibility studies. Funding awarded by the Joint uh, Council Committees across the North is now for uh, the introduction of small-scale renewable generation projects for farmers to diversify to become energy producers. The projects um, funded will supplement farm incomes and as an added benefit, the energy created in the process is reducing the carbon footprint. Yeah. Mr. McCann. Thank you again. I thank the Minister for her response. And she will know that I have been in contact with her department on numerous occasions regarding uh, this issue. But how does the Minister propose to help the applicants who have been successful in Access 3 and, and receiving their, their, their money but are unable to get a conditional letter of offer from NIE to get connected to the grid and therefore uh, a conditional letter of offer is not sufficient uh, for the release of money from Access 3. Will she provide some flexibility to allow this money to be released? Well, the member is right. He has been corresponding with me uh, on this issue, and he is aware that it is actually the individual's responsibility to obtain their, their connection, a grid connection. And NIE is now providing customers with a connection offer that is conditional on um, work required to provide for the export of the proposed generation into the distribution network. And officials have been informed by NIE that upgrading of the line in the areas most affected may be some way off at that time. So it's a matter for the GSECs to um, whether or not they wish to accept that as a condition, the conditional offer, um, letter of offer. Um, I think it's fair to say that GSECs are under pressure in order to be able to um, come, come towards the end of the programme. So I think that whenever they're making a decision on, as to whether or not to accept an application, they'll have to take into uh, account the time frame that's involved to make sure that they're um, spending out on that measure. So. Um, it, there's no barrier to a GSCC actually accepting it. They can accept a conditional letter of offer if, if um, they believe that the, the project will be completed within the timescale. Uh, Joe Byrne. The Minister for her answer. Would the Minister accept that this is a growing problem for many farmers who have got planning permission to build either one turbine or an anaerobic gesture? What can the Minister do in conjunction with the ETA Minister and indeed with Airgrid to try and resolve this situation? Um, the member will be aware that the Commission um, specified that a farm business that is diversifying um, into the sale of renewable energy can only be supported, providing that they are um, selling 100 per cent off, obviously, and they are not using it to um, supplement their own income or offsetting their own um, running costs. And that is an EU requirement, and there is not any room for movement there. 
But I do think that um, looking towards the new rural development programme, there certainly be potential to um, ch change things, albeit we still have to work under the Commission rules, but there certainly will be opportunity in the new rural development programme to, to take another fresh look at this, and it's something that we're actively looking at now as we um, analyse the responses to the rural development programme consultation, which just closed recently. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for that uh, so far. Could the, uh, I know a number of these projects, I'm assuming, in uh, small-scale renewable energy is for wind turbines. And can the Minister uh, indicate to us whether she is supportive of the development of wind turbines or not? Well, I think you very much have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis, but the member will be aware that um, in terms of forest service land, I'm actively exploring uh, the potential for wind farm development. I think that we need to be very careful just in moving forward that we always be mindful of the fact that there are some very good practical examples of how the wider community can benefit whenever we have a wind turbine in an area. But I very much would, would um, take a case-by-case -case approach to, to it, but certainly it's something that I'm um, exploring for, for service land as a potential income for the executive. And as I said, but built into that, I'm very, um, very much a supporter of there being added benefits for, for local communities. John Dallet. Mr. Dallet. Mr. Speaker, question number four. Sorry, five. Going for Growth was developed by the Agri Food Strategy Board as part of the Executive's programme for government. The report identifies opportunities for sustainable growth and targets and increased employment, sales, and exports. Going for Growth contains over 100 recommendations, with responsibility falling to many executive departments and associated agencies, as well as the industry itself. We are currently in the final stages of consideration of these wide-ranging recommendations uh, to identify the best way to take them forward. And as part of that process, we have been considering actions to deliver the aims and objectives of the Going for Growth timescales for delivery and potential funding sources. The Agri-Food Strategy Board has continued to meet in recent months and is working with the other industry bodies, my officials and those of my other executive colleagues, to push forward the industry-led recommendations from the report. So we hope to be in a position to announce the way forward in response to the Board's report in the very near future. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the, the Minister for her answer. I'm sure the Minister would forgive me for suggesting that very often good reports end up as dust collectors. Can she assure me that this report will not become a dust collector and is she satisfied she has the finance available to implement it? I can give you an assurance that I'm absolutely committed to making sure that we see through on the recommendations. This was a fantastic piece of work in partnership with government and industry, and I very much want to see it um, being come to fruition. Uh, we are actively working, myself and the Daddy Minister are working our way through it, and we do hope to be, um, this side of Christmas, hopefully bringing a report to the Executive, which will actually outline um, our, our way forward. We just recently had, um, last week, week before, we've had confirmation of our rural development funding from Europe, so that, that is obviously a tool which I'm going to use to help to deliver on a number of the recommendations. So that helps us to be able to put a uh, better picture in terms of the financial um, approach to it. So, as I say, we're actively working our way through it. I think the, 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 the gains that we can have by putting in the, one of the, the asks in the report is a £400 million investment from the executive, and that will leverage in £1.3 billion from industry. So, to me, that's a massive gain and something that we don't want to miss out on the opportunity of. So, I think we continue to work with the industry. Uh, these, as I have always said, these things are doable. Chris Hazard. Last can call you and, and going back to slash scenario. Um, can I ask the Minister to maybe and she's touched on it already with some of the finances to outline how this will be funded going forward? Come on, yeah, as I just said, um, the, the one of the asks in the report is where, where they're asking for a four hundred million pound investment from the executive and that's going to leverage in one point three billion from industry. And to me that that, that, that would be an amazing achievement. The as I said, the Rural Development Programme funding, we've just recently had confirmation of that, so we're actively working our way through the recommendations and how we might take them forward. Uh, and as I said, the Rural Development Programme is going to be a, a key essential tool in driving forward. So we're, I've taken the opportunity to, to shape the Rural Development Programme along the lines of um, some of the key asks in, in the uh, Growing for Growth document. And I think, that's, as I said, that's going to be the tool that we're going to use. So we have some decisions to make on the way forward. And I do welcome the fact that actually in the recent um, executive reallocation of capital monies that we were able to secure some of that funding which will be used for going for growth. So uh, we're working our way through all of that at the minute. And as I said, I hope to have a report with the executive um, over the next number of weeks. Mr. McCarthy. Mr. McCarthy. 
The Minister will be aware that um, there is a shortage of food uh, technologists and, 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 and that. What is the Minister doing uh, with, uh, within her own department or perhaps with other departments to ensure that there are more food uh, biologists, etc., to uh, carry out your strategy for uh, agri-food? In terms of the, the work of the Agri-Food Strategy Board, and it had 10 subsectors, but some of the areas, key areas that it looked at were workforce, workforce planning, so looking to the future and where we, we might have a skills gap. So we're actively working with Dale to uh, actually take that forward. Um, you'll be aware that our agriculture colleges are oversubscribed, and that's you know, everything from farming and food right, you know, right through all the whole range of courses. And I think that's the beauty about the agri-food industry, because the jobs in the agri-food industry and the employment in the agri-food industry is very wide-ranging. So it's everything from on-farm right through to food and packaging. You, you know, it's, all, it's all there. So um, obviously, we need to have a workforce that's able to meet the, the challenges of the industry. So that's a key, a key part of, of the strategy and moving forward. Campbell. Mr. Campbell. <coughs> Six, Mr. Speaker. Again, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I'll answer questions six and seven together. Following the severe snow and the prolonged period of unfavourable weather in the spring of 2013, I established the Fodder Task Force. This comprised of representatives and stakeholders in the agri-food industry. The task force identified issues which could potentially face the livestock industry in the forthcoming winter and produced an action plan to mitigate problems that could arise. I recently met uh, with the task force representatives for an update, and although they don't intend to meet as a group again until mid-winter, they will get together in the interim if a situation develops and new actions are required. There are many things that farmers can do to prepare for winter, and DART has been very active in supporting, providing support, advice and training. The College of um, Caffrey embarked on a comprehensive programme of workshops, advisory events, publications and face-to-face -face advice during the summer, and this work will continue throughout the winter. To date, some 2,800 farmers attended CAFRI Open Days and 3,900 attendees received training on livestock management topics, including fodder assessment and stocktake, grassland management, increasing production efficiency and soil and sward improvement. CAFRI, along with the main banks, are currently holding a series of meetings with farmers at various locations to provide advice and guidance on farm business cash flow. I'm pleased to report that with the support of CAFRI and AFBI and with the improved weather uh, in the summer this year, <clears throat> fodder yields have increased significantly. Fodder stocks in most farms have recovered to levels which are in balance with projected requirements, with some showing a surplus. Availability of fodder to, for purchase, better fodder budgeting and utilisation leaves livestock farmers well prepared going into this winter. Mr Campbell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, does the Minister not agree that it would be more appropriate if the task force were to meet uh, in preparation for a possible severe winter? Uh, and in relation to what can be done, would she not agree that farming communities are looking to see decisive action as soon as any weather uh, takes a turn for the worse, and then no further arguments subsequent to the bad weather about who shall pick up the bill? Well, I think I was very proactive last year in, in responding to the needs of, of the um, communities that were badly hit by, by the um, snow, severe snow. The task force itself has, is content that they have met, that they have um, addressed some of the key um, areas which they were looking at, particularly around um, you know, cash flow for farmers, even the mental health and well-being of farmers, because it's a very difficult um, situation for them all to be in. Well, thankfully, we are in a better position now, um, given that there's been a lot of work done and preparation and planning and discussions with farmers in preparing for the incoming winter. Um, the task force itself, when I met them uh, quite recently, have said that they'll come together if needs be, but they um, believe that all the work that's ongoing and what they've done to date has been um, sufficient in preparing for the winter ahead. Corey Magalduff. Mr. Magalduff. Corey uh, Magalduff. Uh, Cash Diver shocked. Question number seven. Order, did you just indicate to the member uh, his question has been grouped with question six? Very grateful so for I'm just that calling clarification the to the Kian Kolya. Uh, can I ask the minister when she will have met with UFU and NIAPA, you know, what were the key issues raised by uh, the unions variously? And just to thank the minister for, for being proactive, particularly when she met with farmers in the Glenelg area. Um, yes, so, some of the key areas, as I said, you know, particularly around. It's, uh, such severe weather and left farmers in such a bad financial situation, but also it's their livelihoods were decimated with them, the impact of the snow. So um, mental health was very much a focus in the task force, which was something that um, I thought was, was great. And it was the fact that we had not just the UFU, we had NIAPA, we had the Grain Trade with Meat, Meat Exporters Association, 
uh, Food and Drink Association, the banks. So we had all the key players um, working together and looking at all the challenges, and particularly around how we can be better prepared for winter. And I'm delighted that, um, given the fact that we've had good weather over the summer, it means that we're in a better position this year in terms of stocks, uh, and um, so that's done a lot to help, help the growth and, and recovery. So um, most farms will now have similar stocks of fodder um, to previous years. So and we'll continue to monitor it at Caffrey as well and, and moving forward. But the whole range of issues around uh, were discussed, and again, it was a very wide ranging group, which meant that um, all views were considered. Robin Swan, Mr. Swan. Much, Mr. Speaker. Will the Minister join with me in condemning the scurrilous accusations and comments that are being made in the North Antrim press that some farmers are actually hoping for another bad winter because the compensation they received was an easy way to make money? I haven't seen the report, but I absolutely would condemn that. Um, having been out and, and visiting p people, I could see at first hand the distress that, that people were under, and I don't think anybody would wish that upon themselves to get a few pounds off the department. Mr. Uh, Speaker, and can I and thank the Minister for answering thus far. Um, can I ask the Minister, um, has she met with any other departments in order to deal with the weather conditions to discuss that, given that the predicted forecast uh, is meant to be the coldest winter since 1947? As I said, we have taken forward a, a whole range of issues. The task force is, is a group which is a um, very wide-ranging group. It reflects all the interests from financial, to deal with financial issues with the banks. We have had rural support, the charity that has given um, support to people. We have the department officials. Um, so we have all the key players around that table discussing and planning for the winter ahead. Very mindful of the fact that there are claims of, of a bad winter coming. <coughs> but we certainly are in a better position in terms of the fodder situation. And that task force re will remain in place and will meet as and when required. Um, a number of key um, areas of work were put into train. They are ongoing, but as I said, the task force is very willing to come together at any stage if they feel that that is necessary. Question number seven has already received an answer. Roy Beggs. Question number eight. I commissioned my officials and researchers from the Agri Food and Biosciences Institute to conduct a review of options for the management and disposal of poultry litter. The review was published in April 2012. To progress the recommendations of the review, I and the Daddy Minister launched a small business research competition. The aim of the SBRI is to identify sustainable ways to better utilise poultry litter. 39 applications were received under the competition and were assessed by independent assessors contracted by the Technology Strategy Board. In May 2013, contracts were awarded to eight companies covering nine projects for Phase 1, which is the proof of concept at the feasibility stage. The Phase 1 contracts are for six months and conclude this month. The SBRI project is being managed on behalf of Jared and Eddie by a project management team within the Strategic Investment Board. The project team have held regular meetings with the Phase 1 project con contractors. The team have also engaged positively with the, the poultry sector to discuss their views on implementation of the technology options which are developing through the SBRI. The project team will carefully consider the final reports from the nine SBRI contracts which are due to be received at the end of this month. A decision will then be made on whether the most promising projects require further government assistance. My goal and that of the poultry industry is to have a long-term sustainable and viable options to deal with poultry litter. Mr. Banks. Would the Minister accept that Moy Park have been hugely successful in delivering additional jobs both directly in the industry and also in value-added jobs? And as such, it does seem that the potential that exists for expanding further uh, is being limited by the relatively late involvement in addressing this issue by, by her department. Does she accept that? I accept that my park are a major employer and, and, and provide uh, quite a lot of employment and it's something that we want to, to grow. And I talked earlier about the Agri-Food Strategy Board and that's um, obviously about growing business, it's about increasing our um, job creation, it's about um, growing our export market. So we don't want any business to be in any disadvantage in terms of them being able to grow and um, myself and, and the Deputy Minister have been very mindful of the, the timetable that we're working towards, um, given that we have uh, the ruling from Europe. We're very much working through that. It has been a process. We have came, there's been quite a number of technologies that have came forward as potential ways to deal with the poultry litter. I am quite pleased with those. and We've now narrowed it down to nine, and we'll narrow it down even further again. So um, I think that the work that we've done has been appropriate and adequate to address the problem, which is an industry problem, but obviously something that government want to um, try and work with industry to resolve the issue, which is why we have brought forward the SBRA project. More questions to the Minister. We now move to topical questions, and I call Colm Eastwood. Mr Eastwood. Thank you. Uh, Mr Speaker, can I thank the Minister for her answer so far, and can I ask her, um, has she got the figures as to how many young people 
have entered into the agri-food sector in the last couple of years? I don't have those figures on me, but I'm happy to, to provide them to the member. But it's safe to say that um, the fact that our agriculture colleges are oversubscribed, that in itself is, is fantastic and shows that young people now see a future in farming and food. Where in, in the past, a number of years ago, it would have been very much seen as a sunset industry. So the fact that we have record numbers um, of young people wanting to get into farming and food, that's very positive for the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for her answer. Can I ask her what work that she does, does she do with other departments like Dedi and, and Dell uh, to provide maybe grant assistance or whatever to encourage people not only to get involved in, in the business but to actually have employment uh, after they go to the college? Well, I mean, there's quite a range of, of um, areas of support available from even from my own department, um, particularly for uh, and if you look at the rural development programme and the amount of businesses that avail of support through through that avenue. We have processing marketing grants going forward to help people expand. So there's quite a range of supports that are there and that's open to everybody. But obviously it's, it's good um, that we have so many young people, as I said, wanting to stay in the industry and see a future in the industry and I want to be able to encourage that to, to grow. The Agri-Food Strategy Report, which I talked about earlier, is a joint piece of work between myself and Detti. But um, even alongside that, in the report, there are a number of recommendations which are um, applicable to Dale. So we are working together and in partnership for, um, to promote young people coming forward in the industry and try and uh, create the conditions or assist the industry to create the conditions that people see a future in farming and food. Jim Wiles. Mr. Wiles. Could the Minister please let us know why she objected to the transfer of the functions of the Rivers Agency to the Department of Regional Development, which would, particularly in urban areas, have led to a more unified approach to flooding? Um, well, the member will be aware that he is referring to the PEDU report, and there was quite a number of recommendations, all of which have been taken forward. But I don't believe that you just need to willy-nilly pick out things and transfer into other departments without having a proper strategic discussion. The executive will be looking at uh, as all the departments as a whole, and then I'm very happy for it to be considered as part of that bigger discussion. But I don't think that it was the solution to solve all problems by just picking out Rivers Agency and putting it into DRD. Mr. Wells, the Minister accepts that the bulk of Rivers Agency work now is in the urban situation. And if she is convinced that that would lead to a more uh, efficient resolution of flooding problems, will she support the transfer? I'm absolutely open to taking a look at it, at it in the round. As I said, it's part of the wider executive discussion around all the different departments and where things should um, comfortably sit. Very happy to take a look at it. But at this moment in time, as I said, the PEDU report created or set out a number of recommendations, all of which have been taken forward or are currently being worked through. This one, I don't believe, is something that we need to do as a standalone issue, but I'm very happy to take a look at it in the round. Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I ask the Minister to inform the House what work can be done to assist farm, business, farm businesses who are experiencing difficulties in connecting renewable energy projects to the grid? Well, we dealt with that issue um, earlier in question time. As I said, one of the, the biggest problems is that um, when it comes to uh, giving grant aid support, Europe has very clearly set down that um, you have to be selling off 100%. Uh, to, you cannot be using it for your own use to offset your own costs. So, there's a particular problem with that and something I think that we seriously need to address. I think there's opportunities to address it in the new rural development programme and how we take it forward. However, um, we're still going to be bound by European Commission uh, decisions, but there's a, a clear problem that people can't get a connection to the grid. They can get the grant support, they can get everything in place, but they can't get a connection to the grid. And again, uh, you have to have your own single connection. And again, that's creating all sorts of problems, a separate connection to the grid than your own supply. So there's a range of problems I think need to be identified and we have an opportunity to possibly look at that in the new programme. Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the Minister for answer. Then will, will the Minister today then give a commitment to farmers that she will help, her department will help them look for cheaper energy suppliers? Absolutely. I'm always happy to, to assist the farming community in, in whatever um, we can do to, to, to move forward in the most effective and efficient manner. This is a particular issue around renewable energies. It's something that we all want to see more of, but there are barriers then to, to farmers being able to take this forward because of e European Commission rules. So that's something that we need to seriously address and something that I'm engaged with the Commission on. Mr. Kelly. Would the Minister give us an assessment of the impact of the rural white paper, especially in terms of improving the lives of rural people? Well, the Rural White Paper was um, a really significant piece of work that was taken forward in the previous term um, under Michelle Gildenew, and a lot of progress has been made in terms of um, taking forward all the actions that have been identified <coughs> in, that, in that document. However, I want to take a fresh look at it because I don't want it to be just something that is a tick box exercise for departments to say that they've delivered on what they had previously promised. I very much wanted to be a living and working uh, document, so I've asked officials to actually take a look at that again. And also, in addition to that, to explore the opportunities for 
um, legislating for rural proofing. And also, um, I'm very keen to again look at the idea of a rural champion because I think um, there will be a key role for a rural champion in, in, in moving forward. Mr. Kelly. Uh, good morning, good lesson there, Frederick Shin. How good you, Shaw. Could the Minister, and I thank her for her answer tonight, could you maybe elaborate a wee bit on what the rural champion uh, would do, what, what that idea entails? There was some discussion on, on this in, in the previous term, and for me, very much, I, I would see it as a body that could be either inside or, or outside of government, I think preferably on the outside, that would champion rural issues, that would look towards um, gaps in terms of information around um, statistics and, I think, research that is, that is much needed in terms of rural communities. So they could, and, and how I see it working is that, that um, they could be basically... Uh, providing research, providing information that would, would assist in challenging all departments in terms of their delivery for rural communities. So, um, just as I said, as an early concept stage, it is something that was discussed before, but wasn't taken forward at, at that time. But I, I certainly want to explore it again, because I do think that it could be a key role and a, and a major win for the rural communities. Lord Morrow. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, does the Minister agree with me that rural crime is a very worrying and escalating problem? What new initiatives has she taken uh, to tackle this worrying trend? I do agree with, with the member, and we have seen um, quite a number of cases highlighted recently, particularly around cattle theft. Um, I regularly engage with um, PSNA and, and uh, Chief Constable and also the Department of Justice to talk about um, how we can work together because the, the levels of rural crime, including agriculture related crime, are, are, are concerning. Um, I actually just recently met the Minister for Justice on the 14th of October, where we talked about. Um, the rural crime unit that's just been established and we now have appointed uh, Danny Graham uh, from the Veterinary Services Invest Enforcement Branch who are going to sit on that rural crime um, steering unit. So I think that, that's something that's very progressive. We also look at um, uh, working with PSNA, working with the guards. So we, we need to um, very much have a collective approach to this. So um, anything, there's been some very good initiatives, particularly around freeze banding and, and things like that that have been taken forward. But also one of the areas that I want to look at is in future when you're providing grant support for, for example, for small items of, of machinery for around a farm, that maybe alongside that you could put a requirement that it has to be um, identified, you know, so, so it's easily identified if, if stolen. So um, we're looking at a number of initiatives, as I said, we need to work closely with veterinary service, the enforcement branch, PSNA, Gardaí, Department of Justice, all, all those people that have a role to play in trying to tackle rural crime. Lord Morrow. Thank the Minister for her answer. Just to, in her reply, she mentioned that one of the issues that they had looked at or were taken forward was freeze branding. Could you tell the Assembly today to what extent this has been used in the drive against rural crime? I think it's fair to say that um, we probably would have thought we'd seen a, a, we'd see a, a, a more of an uptake of, of the initiatives that, than actually occurred. I know and I are actually concerned as to why that is, and they're thinking of it as maybe a number of factors. People have just been busy because of the, the, the weather. People have been managing their own farms and getting on with the day-to-day -day business and maybe haven't had, a, had as enough, enough time to, to focus on this sort of area. So one of the things I think they're planning to do is actually go out again and try and uh, recruit more people to actually get involved because it is a, a positive initiative if um, we can get more and more people to, to take it up, given the fact that cattle theft is, is you know, quite, a, quite a high uh, number at present. And we've seen actually in your own constituency quite a number of cases um, of cattle theft be, um, occurring over the last year. Raymond McCartney. Mr. McCartney. Uh, Colin Cooler, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Colin Cooler, uh, I mean, further to the last question, the Minister said in relation to rural crime that she had met with the PSNA. W would there be any particular things which they are doing to, to ensure that the rural crime decreases? Um, yeah, as I said, there's been quite a few local initiatives that PSNI have, have been taking forward, particularly in, in uh, uh, rural areas, and also they've um, got involved in a lot of, particularly around the border areas, they've got involved with um, the Gardaí in terms of um, combating crime in border areas. <coughs> and I think that's key in terms of, um, particularly when it comes to cattle theft, if we're um, serious about um, tackling that, we have to very much have a joined up approach. So. Um, I'm very much committed to making sure that our veterinary enforcement team work with the, the guards, work with the PSNA, and make sure that we roll out um, all the schemes that are there that are to the benefit of rural communities, particularly around farm watch um, schemes and, and things like that, which are, which are very beneficial. So um, there's a lot of work ongoing, and we just need to keep, um, keep, keep on with it and, and keep challenging uh, and trying to eradicate the, the crime that exists out there. 
Raymond McCartney. Gurmi Ogat, a Count Cooler goes Buega slash in error, Don Ragerson. Thank you very much, Count Cooler, and can I thank the Minister for that answer? She alluded to the fact that her officials, the PSNA and the Garda Sikhanar, are meeting regularly. Is she confident that it's regular enough and, and that they will have particular initiatives to ensure that we tackle rural crime? Yeah, I think, I think there's a, 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 it's fair to say there's a significant level of engagement and um, they've actually had quite a, a number of successful um, investigations that have been taken forward. So I think that shows that, that it is working, um, that we need to do more of it, obviously, but um, I do think that, that, um, that shows that it is working, particularly around smuggling um, incidents, which we can see, obviously, people um, trying to, to uh, I suppose, move from one jurisdiction to the other. So um, there is very progressive work ongoing and we just uh, need to keep driving forward with that in the time ahead. Mr Clark. Mr. Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, given that the Rural Development Programme is in its final stages, can she give the House an assessment of how she thinks it has went? I think it's been very successful and, uh, and, and it gives me great pleasure whenever you're out and about actually seeing the projects that have benefited um, from it. From, from tourism initiatives to um, community facilities right through to business diversification. So um, I don't have facts and figures with me, but I'm very happy to provide that to the member. But in my opinion, it's been very successful. Um, are there lessons to learn for the future programme? Absolutely. And we're actively doing that now as we work our way through the consultation responses that we've, re that we've received. Things around simplification, I think there's a number of areas where we can um, improve things and make sure that applications are, particularly for grant aid, are relevant to the level of funding that you're, that you're requesting. So there's a number of areas I think we can improve things, but has it been successful? Yes. Clark. Uh, can I thank the, the Minister for that answer? And I mean, I would agree with her, uh, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the success, in terms of getting the money in the ground. However, I'm glad that the Minister did come to the criticism of her own department. Can she outline maybe what her department is going to do in the future, given that it took them almost 18 months to get some of this money on the ground? If the member is referring to what we're going to do to plan for the new programme, that's what we're actually working through now. As I said, the consultation is closed. We're working our way through the responses, and then we decide on the way forward. And I hope to do that in the early part of next year. But for me, I think the focus needs to be on animation now. We need to be working um, the areas up, making sure that um, they're good to go whenever the new programme kicks in. We don't want to have any delays, uh, and I'm making sure that officials are, are working on that actually now as we speak to make sure that we can hit the ground running, we can start spending as soon as, as, soon as the new programme starts. Chris Little. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what work she is doing to break down barriers between people from different backgrounds in rural areas? The, I can actually write to the member with more detail, but there's a number of projects that have been funded, and again, through um, the Rural, rural Development Programme. Um, one, one of the areas recently that we, we um, funded was a um, churches based forum. So it was like taking a look at, um, I can't remember the, the title of the project, but it's basically. Um, funding for an organisation to bring together people from different churches and discuss rural issues and issues that are relevant to them. So we've been involved in a number of, of projects like that. Um, very, very um, happy to, to, to take a look at all of those things, particularly around the tackle on poverty and social isolation framework, which I have, because I think that's very much about um, looking at issues that are, that are out there in rural communities and how can we can bring people together and, and work, effectively work for them. And one of the successes of that programme actually was um, the, the grant scheme that we brought forward that allowed groups from local areas to apply for what they thought <laughs> was needed in their area, so it wasn't the department saying this is part of money and this is how it should be spent. It very much was um, a, a bottom-up approach. People came forward and said what they thought was needed. So there's been quite a range of, of projects funded through that way also. <coughs> Thank the Minister for her response. I'm uh, encouraged that there is work ongoing. I asked the Minister if she would accept that there are often hidden interfaces in rural areas, unlike the more concrete interfaces we see in urban areas. Yes, absolutely. I think it's something that we need to tackle right across the board. And um, you're, you're absolutely right. I think sometimes just for the nature of a rural area can be very much a hidden issue. So I'm happy to, to engage and, and to try and break down any barriers that are there and that exist for anybody. Tom Elliott. <coughs> Elliott. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, could the minister confirm that a recent action taken by the Department of Agriculture uh, against a Fermanagh farm was rejected by the courts? I didn't hear the question. <laughs> can the member repeat the question? Apologies, Chairman uh, or Speaker. Um, can the Minister confirm that a, a recent action taken by the, her department against a Fermanagh farmer was rejected by the courts? It, I, I won't confirm it because it's a legal issue and I don't want to get into it in the House, but I'm happy to talk to the member outside of the question time. Okay, Mr. Speaker, maybe restricts my, my further point, but I, I'll term it in this way. 
If, if the farmer is cleared, will he now receive his uh, single farm payments that has been withheld for the last number of years? I'm not going to get into the ins and outs of one individual's situation. Order, members, I'm for the Minister of Agriculture.